I'll be back. He's looking at you, kid. I'm your Huckleberry. What are you looking at, butthead? Hey, bud, what's your problem? What if this is as good as it gets? Well, right now, I don't feel too agreeable. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens. And here we go. This is the debut, the maiden voyage of the great classic movie debate, which is the sister channel, or some might say the twisted sister Sister channel channel. (laughs) of the great classic rock debate. I'm Kenny. I'm Paul. And I'm Steve. Yes, it's going to be a threesome as opposed to a twosome. So, um, and I'll go ahead and mention for the record, you guys are going to carry the weight. Uh, I'm going to be like a backseat driver, but you guys are going to carry the weight uh, because you guys are both encyclopedias when it comes to movie knowledge. Uh, But I have a little bit of trivial stuff that I'll contribute here and there. So our goal is going to be very similar. We're going to talk anything and everything as it relates to movies, whether it be the box office experience or watching it on video at home or whatever be the case. Uh, Everything is included. That's how we're going to try to do it. And we also want to always add, if you are watching this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. As with the other channels, that's that's how we build our channel. So please do that. I'd like to start off with just this little tidbit. It's going to be short, but it pertains to Siskel and Ebert. But I think it's a it's a, a thought that is probably going to apply to virtually everything that we do as far as our videos here. And that is this. Uh, You guys may know better than me, but I think the first time I recall ever seeing them on TV was back around 82 or 83. Is that about right or no? Yeah. Okay. Sounds about right. Okay. So I was a young man at the time, still had hair, and I was also like a bodybuilder dude at the time. So anybody, you know, to me at the age of 22 or whatever, anybody who wasn't a bodybuilder dude was a geek, and I thought those guys were geeks, all right? So I would watch the show and listen to their elitist pontification (laughs) and it would anger me because at the age of 22 i had little to no sophistication at all about watching movies and i was watching them mostly from that younger perspective of give me entertainment i wasn't looking for high cinematic quality or whatever and it would anger me when i would see a movie that i loved and then they would trash it okay So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want us to always keep in mind when we're talking about movies. And also, Paul, you often use this little phrase. You'll say, hey, I want you to watch this movie, but turn your brain off. Yes. And what I'm getting at is movies can be scored according to their cinematic value, but they can also be scored according to their entertainment value and probably other ways, too. But those are the two main And I want us to always keep that in mind when we're talking about movies, because I think it's perfectly fair to say, I'm just going to use Taken as an example, okay? This is not a movie of high cinematic quality, but I can watch it a million times and never get tired of it. To me, it's the greatest entertainment uh, among the greatest entertainment ever produced by Hollywood. So I just think it's important not to sound like, idiots if we start saying man taken that was great so i just want to always distinguish how we're scoring it just to be clear on on where we're coming from i don't want somebody to to get the wrong idea and think that they're watching oscar material if that's where and the reverse is also true so uh so anyway moving forward with that thought in mind if i'm On the same page, you guys wanted to talk about monster movies or something like that tonight. Go ahead and someone start us off and tell me what we're doing. Uh, Yeah, Steve suggested it was great. uh, Horror movies and some are monsters, some are horror in the mind. Okay. Right. Um, Steve was ahead of me on this. Like I liked certain types of scary horror movies, but I didn't particularly love the traditional uh, universal monsters, okay? Only okay. as I've gotten a little older and when you start, and me and Steve talked about this earlier today, what was the origin of horror movies, okay? And a lot of it, it has to do with the Germans, okay? Uh, 
the expressionist type of art, right? And they they said, wow, what if we took these, because people look at a painting and get all freaked out by a painting. So some Germans eventually made some movies, but before that happened, a uh, well-known story. Uh, let's see here. There's a bunch of famous writers, and you're going to make fun of me. I should know this as I have a stupid degree in writing. Um, there was a contest and these three writer, four writers got to this castle. They said, we're going to have a uh, contest to come up with the scariest, most horrific movie. That was the contest parameters. And this okay. was sometime recently or 100 years no, ago? No, this was like in the 1700s. Steve will oh, get the date better. Okay. Than I did. okay. And there was a bunch of famous writers in the room. And the person who won was named Mary Wollaston Craft Shelley. She wrote Frankenstein or right. the Modern Prometheus. And that was one of the first horror, like, that's how horror got into people's imaginations. Okay. So when we get to Steve in a second, he's going to talk about that. And the very first horror movie was written by the Germans, and people should probably know this, it's called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Right, 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 right. The when, the first cut, when the first came out, it was so scary that people had nervous breakdowns Wow. in Germany. And then they go back and add this little section at the beginning and end and say, oh, Really, you know, too bad this was just a dream and it didn't really, really happen, right? Oh, so okay. Like people out of it, okay? So then that movie got notoriety and success. And then Steve's going to talk about, or what's, because I asked you this question, it's like, what started Universal on after that with the horror movies? And we can go on to that, but go ahead, Steve. Okay. Yeah, so what really got Universal Universal going was really after the advent of the talkie, so after 1927. So 1931, Dracula and Frankenstein came out, which really kick-started off the Universal monster movies. And Both so, of those so, in 31? Yes, I believe 31 wow. or 32. Okay. Uh, I think they came out in the same year. Dracula was first, and I think Frankenstein uh, came out later that year. I think Dracula was in, in February. I don't know why I know this. It's just... Uh, <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a dork. And so uh, uh, to me, well, so we can talk about, if we want to talk about the German expressionists, um, a lot of that came down from the cinematographers. Uh, Carl Freund, who was the uh, cinematographer for on Dracula, and then later directed The Mummy a couple of years after that, um, you know, it's the real use of that that black and white, that contrast there, um, to me, is what makes those those movies what they are. Um, if you go back and look at Dracula, there's n what's interesting about it. So that 1931, talkies have been around for a few years, like I said, but there's no score. There's a score at the beginning of the movie and a score at the end, and everything in between. It's it's all. Um, Audio oh, that's recorded effects. live on set, wow. and and, and yeah, live sound effects, and it's not really wow. until you get to the Bride of Frankenstein, which for me is my favorite horror movie of all time, favorite monster really? movie. Yeah, so 1930, I think it was 1934, still directed by James Whale, who also directed The Invisible Man, and if you go back and look, I mean, the visual effects for that time for the 30s, I mean, f were phenomenal, oh right? But Bride of Frankenstein, not only it, took the original themes of Frankenstein and then created what ultimately in my mind ended up being uh you know one of the top three horror monster icons of all time in the Bride of Frankenstein but they also added a soundtrack to it and so you had a couple of years after that where uh you had improved audio improved uh improved cinema techniques um the the camera was James Whale was actually very and Carl Freund were um, renowned for this. They were kind of the first people to actually move the camera off of the tripod. And so you, you have some of that. They, they started using Dutch angles, especially in The Bride of Frankenstein towards the end of that. Uh, so just the visual effects from that were- That is a Dutch angle. Yes, the Dutch angles, um, the cinematography, and the fact they also used miniatures in the bride of frankenstein and by the when i mean miniatures they actually uh there's a scene where uh kind of uh dr frankenstein's mentor 
uh, so to speak, he has created miniature people that live in these little glass bottles. And you have the miniature people on screen with the the life size, normal size humans running back and forth. And, you know, for something like that to occur in 1934, and, and it looks fantastic wow. to this day. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's phenomenal what they were able to do almost 100 years ago. Right. And, and you know, just for the record, um, for years now, for year, 20, 25, however many years, well, however long Google's been around, 20, 20 plus years, every year around um, October, I will do a refresh greatest horror movies of all time greatest scary you have to choose your adjectives carefully because they're they're not always exactly the same uh but it the cabinet of dr caligari uh frankenstein bride of frankenstein dracula it's old ones they always come up usually in the top 10 and it's amazing that after so many years those still rank so high on that type of list yeah and i wanted to touch on one thing that paul brought up you know, I think part of the reason why I think a lot of this came from the Germans in the 30s is is really what was going on there, you know, on, a, on an economic scale during the 30s. You know, they, after World War II, they came out, they, you know, they're basically in a depression. They had high right. inflation. So I think all those kind of economic factors influenced a lot of what was going on uh, in the German cinema in the 30s with uh, sure. you, you had yeah, Nosferatu right. that came out. Um and Paul, I don't know if you wanted, I know you, I think you may have wanted to speak about that a little bit, but that well, was kind of the a, precursor to Dracula right. in the United States. Right. It, um, cause Steve and I were, we had a fun talk today and, uh, about intellectual property rights and then, and the movie you and I saw together, the shadow of the vampire with Willem Dafoe. It's a very slow moving movie, but it's brilliant. Right. right. And the it movie. Is. And they talk about the this is the Weimar Republic between right. World War One, World War Two, right? And um, I guess whatever the situation was, they couldn't get the rights from Bram Stoker. And Steve and I were talking about, I don't know if, if they were what they would would call intellectual property rights in Germany in 1926 or whatever it was. We don't know, but in the movie they specifically mentioned they can't use the name Dracula because Bram they couldn't get permission from Bram Stoker's family. Oh, thus and then they start talking. Yeah, and then they start. Remember, everyone on the set is on heroin. Remember, John Malkovich is in the movie, and they're all right, doing heroin. Right, right. And it's a brilliant movie because they go, they go to this castle, and they meet this guy named Max Shrek, which is the name of the actor who plays Nosferatu in, in the real movie. And remember, he, he uh, Willem Dafoe tells this other guy now when he walks up. Remember, this other guy has never seen him before. I want you to act really scared because he's scary looking. So you go in that tunnel and it says Jart German castle, uh, castle in Transylvania or in Transylvania. And when the guy walks up, the guy is really scared in real life. And he doesn't have to tell him to be scared. The guy's like, he wants to get out of there. And he's like, he's trying to run. The guy's trying to hold him there. It's really, fun. but the movie's brilliant. It talks about that. And uh, so Steve, talk about the financial, like, Dracula and Frankenstein and Mummy and Werewolf and all they started making money, right? Like that's why what drove this. Right, they, yeah. they had to. If they hadn't made money, then this would have never become right. a thing. Yeah. Absolutely. But then, I mean then hold on, what's that one second? Then talk about the oversaturation to where horror movies died out. Yeah. So yeah, Paul's exactly right. I think the budget for Dracula and Frankenstein back in the 30s was about two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. And cumulative to date, this is just not including the merchandising, but they, they estimate that they have made off the, the various theatrical runs and uh, video copies close to 40 to $50 million just, just from the, the, the playing the movie. Right. Um, or more. Yeah. Or, or more. Yeah. Merchandise yeah. probably far exceeds that because people yeah. like me buy the t-shirts or, right. or whatnot. So that kind of started this whole trend of the thirties, into the 40s and 50s of Universal just making, they became known as the Monster Studio. And people like me who grew up in, you know, the well, starting in the 90s when they re-released it on VHS, I think I've bought Dracula in the, in the kind of the original uh, horror, Universal Monster movies six or seven times, starting from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray to wow. now on 4K. Uh, but yeah, Paul's right. I mean, kind of, in my mind, probably what is the... Aside from Bride of Frankenstein, probably the tech, most technically brilliant movie 
that Universal did was Creature from the Black Lagoon, which came out in 53 or 54, and it was in 3D. And that was kind of the height and saturation of right. the the monster movie and, and horror movie market at that standpoint. Later, they started doing like the kind of the the spoof movies with Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Right, and, right, right. Those types and of movies. Milk so it, at that milk point, it. <laughs> yeah, they milked it. And, uh, you know, it's always the, the the last movie that doesn't make money is kind of the uh, where the, when they end up stopping stopping to make right. movies. And so there was kind of a law, I think, in at least in, in most of the 60s in the United States with in the horror genre. And it didn't really yeah. pick up again. Um, until probably the late seventies or and maybe mid seventies with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then what John Carpenter did with with Halloween and, and seventy eight, right. and kind of just started that oh, whole yeah, yeah. That's the monster franchise. side. That's the, um, the horror side. There was a movie that came out in seventy five, seventy six. Kenny called The Exorcist. Oh, of course, and that movie got the seven. It was earlier than uh, I think it was seventy two. I think yeah, it could be yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice. it. Um, I guess they were looking for a more intellectual version of the of the horror, and I think right. The Exorcist led opened the doors for all these Conjuring and these movies that I would rather well, die. It opened the door watch. for The Omen and The Omen too, because you know Omen's once, awesome. Yeah, but once they had opened the door to like um, you know religious related things, and it yeah. was a huge hit because they were supernatural. They were yeah, uh, yeah a little uh, reluctant to tread too heavy on that sort of thing. Uh, but because it, the exorcist, I mean, I was groundbreaking, you know, yeah. it's, you know, you watch it now and it does seem sort of can't like it. I saw it about a month ago. I still like it. You really? I, okay. Yeah. But, I, but listen, uh, but it was scary. I was a kid. It was scary. The omen for me, I, I couldn't sleep. That's how scary it was. <laughs> Seriously. I love the omen. Cause it used a lot of yeah. biblical background. Exactly. Like with Sam Neill, when he played the grown up Damien, they were, they were, like living out revelations of the Bible right. in it, right? And all these things. And it was, yeah, Sam Neill. But anyway, but yeah, so it's fascinating how this horror genre, and then uh, like Steve said, John Carpenter, Halloween at one point was the most profitable movie ever made. What oh, I didn't cost, know like, that. $80,000 yeah, to until make. recently. Yeah, it What's made that? like, it, go ahead, Steve. Oh, I was going to say, it, I can't remember what beat it in terms of profitability, but it was the most profitable movie of all time up until a couple of, just a few years ago. I think they spent, again, it was two fifty or $300,000. That's what movie. it was, yeah. And it I'm made, a huge John uh, Carpenter fan. I, um, right. I own almost all of his movies. I listen to the commentaries. And I think on Halloween, yeah, their budget was two around two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. Wow. Wow. I can't remember Amazing. what the box office gross is. But again, you know, if you look at the, it, it's played every Halloween, obviously. Oh, yeah on so many uh so many sequels and so. and in 1978 and it was released in october it stayed in the theaters for months probably even all the way through christmas yeah it's, it was it's just one really of the first popular movies. yeah and i think it's probably it's the first like scary movie i can recall seeing as a kid i think seeing it on hbo and just being freaked out of my mind at, right at, as a kid but you know then that and then after that you had Friday the Thirteenth, which was kind of the, uh, which was a poor man's version of Halloween. Very poor, was right. already a, right. <laughs> independent movie. But I think Friday the Thirteenth was shot on sixteen millimeter, or maybe probably super sixteen at the time. I'm not even sure yeah. it was shot thirty five millimeter film, but right, I could. And be it was wrong. a poor man's version, but I'll tell you what, it did make a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it can say thank you to Halloween for that, by the way. Because the Halloween, yeah. the people who loved Halloween went to see it, even if they knew it wasn't going to be as good. And and what I think makes that movie just so, what makes it over the top scary is the the score on that, which is Absolutely done by right. Carpenter, oh, yeah. the director. Oh yeah, oh my and that god, piano is a piano, right? The piano, dude, dude, you know, like oh, oh yeah, it's yeah, keyboard synthesizer, which actually Rage Against the Machine sampled on. Uh, well, I can't remember the name of the song, but on the Battle of Los Angeles on their third uh, and final studio album. Okay. All right. So quick question. You talked about the um, Creature of the La Black Lagoon in uh, 3D, I guess? Yes. In the, yeah. Okay. So in, the, in 1953 or whatever year it was, 
Was that a big deal? Did audiences go crazy over that? Or did people say, what the hell is this all about? Or do you oh, know? Oh, no, that, that was one of the movies that kind of kickstarted the whole 3D uh, boom there in the 50s and reinvigorated okay. kind of the cinema there. Um, there okay. were obviously other movies that utilized 3D, but that was one of the big, that, that may, I don't know if it was the first 3D movie, but it was one of the first 3D releases or major releases uh, anyways, and, and now okay. if you buy it, you can actually the version that's on Blu-ray right now, if you have a 3D uh, theater, which or a TV screen, which I don't, you can actually right, watch right. it in 3D. Well, but then, you know, that kind of fizzled out later into the, the 50s. Right. Because, listen, we were talking about Friday the 13th. So I'm going to mention this quick. Friday the 13th <laughs> Part 3 was called Friday the 13th 3D. Right. 15. And so I went to see it with a big group of friends the night that it opened. And in one of the very early scenes, J uh, Jason, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a spear. He throws a spear. Is yeah. that a spear gun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it and it looks like it's coming right at you. And then that in that moment, it was scary. The rest of the movie, the 3D was a waste, and the movie was awful. So you know, I, hold it. Did you did you see that the rocking chair theater? No, I saw it in Auburn. Oh, because I saw it at West Palm Beach. Okay. When I was in high school, and I was like. Yeah, because they, they they made an exaggeration of that. Because when when he threw it, and then you saw the aftermath of it too. The guy right. stuck with it, right. and the camera's like, no, like right, that. right, yeah. Similar, Similar, go ahead, Steve. The Jaws 3D. Oh, I remember Gosh. that one, Lou. Gossett when I remember as a kid seeing that, I was about. I think that came out in '83. That is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, right. uh, it was really great. A really cool 3D movie in 1983 when you're six okay. years old. I, if I'm you sure you watch right. it now, it, the effects are horrible, and the director <laughs> even will acknowledge that that they right. had very little time to do the to work on the effects. You, you can tell watching that it's low budget. Okay, since we brought up Jaws, question: Sometimes movie genres overlap, and it's not necessarily accurately. Because again, I told you how I like to Google like scariest or horror movies or whatever. And oftentimes I'm looking at a list of horror movies, but Jaws shows up on there. And I say to myself, I don't think of that as, as a horror movie. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Is it a horror movie? Is it a monster movie? Certainly you can say it's scary, although I don't know if it qualifies as a scary movie. So you guys tell me. Well, let me go first. Um, go ahead, Paul. I'm a lot older than Steve. And so... In, in my opinion, it is a horror movie because it's the horror of being eaten, which the likelihood of you being eaten by a great white is one in a million, right? So, and so Steve probably doesn't, well, you and I, I was terrified to go in the water deep at the beach for years after that. I, I was for about a year and then that was it. And well, I, was, I, just, you know, it, I was 14. This place, the horror is in your mind. Right. right of, of the shark. So I guess... It is a horror movie, Steve. What do you think? I, I agree. I think it's a horror movie, and I was debating about that. I, I always debate about that, and I will say about Jaws. Jaws is actually my favorite movie of all time. I have really? seen that. Yeah, I grew up on it. Um, you know, I was born in 77, so I, I wasn't old enough to right. see it in the theaters. I did right. see it a couple of months ago when they re-released it in IMAX. But for me, growing up, I recorded it off of, like, ABC one uh saturday night and i pro i have i've seen it at least well over 200 times and to me yeah growing up in the 80s going to florida to the beach as a kid right. i was scared to death to go like past my knees and eventually you you get out of that and, and right. even to this day now um i prefer to only go in the water like in the in the caribbean where it's clear just because right i've, right. I've seen too many uh, shark attack uh, shows on on on, on Discovery Channel, but right, but yeah. It, to me, it's it's definitely it's a it's a it's a the great white shark is, I guess it's a realistic monster. It's a monster that exists in real life, right? And, so, uh, you know, I was gonna say we don't worry about being chased by uh, Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees, right? right? Which is just as likely as getting bit by a shark. I don't know why we're not worried about those two guys, but we're worried about a damn shark. But anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Steve, you said you probably had five or six different monster movies. So you got anything else going there for us? Yeah. So let, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll just go down the list. Alien. Oh so, my God. Okay. 
It's a sci-fi I, I mean, I movie, think, but it's a I horror think Paul, movie. I, I think Paul will agree. For me, one of the best movies of all time. Period. Agreed. Just period. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because it's terrifying. And it qualifies as a monster movie. The Alien's a monster. It qualifies as a scary movie. It qualifies as a horror movie. It qualifies as all of those things. And man, the, the director knew how to bring out... He knew how to push your buttons in order to bring out the terror because in that movie, you, you have to stay on the edge of your seat. You don't know what's coming next or what's around the corner, and you're terrified to find out. Yeah, it was groundbreaking in a lot of hundred different ways, but like at the beginning of the movie, you have no idea who the hero is going to be. Right. Yeah. Who's going to live, right? And it's this really tall, pretty woman who lives... And she shows, she comes out of her shell, not out of her shell, but she shows her hero qualities, heroine qualities. And and when people go, oh, I don't like women here. There's no women. I, like, I, I start naming them off. And she's at the top of Ripley, the best female action hero, heroine of all time, in my opinion. Number one. Yeah, and I think the one thing that it has, that like these great movies of the 70s and 60s, the one thing that they have that I think a lot of modern movies lack is just that defining scene, that memorable movie moment. There's not movies today don't have those movie moments. And for me, like Alien has one of the best movie moments of all time where you're, they're at a point where they had the face hugger come on and they get it off and they think everything's OK. And the, then they're sitting there having dinner and all of a sudden thing comes out <laughs> out of the chest <laughs> and the oh my chest God. Bursting scene. Right. And it's it was so shocking back then, and even today, and, and that's just something that you know modern day movies I think lack is just that that memorable scene. Yeah, and I, I agree. Has- not not only was it shocking and memorable and all of those things, but so often scenes that are intended to shock, you see them coming. Like you, you that one nobody saw it coming. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody. Yes. Yeah, and Steve, Steve brought, up, brought up a brilliant point, really brilliant. Um, I went to UCLA. I have a degree in screenwriting from UCLA. And one of our teachers, her name is, coincidentally, Linda Voorhees. And she would tell you when she when you were going to and work, workshop on your scripts, she would say, that was her number one thing to say, Steve. She would, and you knew this accomplished. She goes, Paul, this is a movie moment. She would say that. Okay, because this is what people will remember. And, and Steve's absolutely right. This, you got to have these movie moments, like in Jason and, and Friday the Thirteenth. It's not really. No, I don't know. No, um, but I think we could. We need to spend a day on John Carpenter. So let's not bring up John Carpenter anymore. Can we all okay. worship him? It's, Absolutely. Yeah. That was the next on my list. So I'll, I'll I'll just reference it. I won't say anything other than the thing. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean. That, God, I mean, how many movie moments are in there? I, I it was a, you know what it is, Kenny? Is like they they make this okay? We know it's a horror movie. We're gonna make it a real movie, right? Right. We're gonna make right. it a it's real all movie. practical effects, right? Yeah, that's, we, we yeah, that's the other thing. Listen, while we're on the thing, we need to mention that it is a remake yeah. of uh, the the thing from another planet, or what was the original? It's another world. They from outer space, I think. Or is this a thing from another world? Okay, I think that's it. I think that was it. Whatever, yeah. yeah. And 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 ju- when I found that out, which was, I don't know, five or ten years ago, I got a hold of the original and watched it, which is actually pretty good. But, man, that remake is better. Well, if you want to know, here's just a, a little side bit of trivia here. If you watch Halloween, so that came out before The Thing, the movie right. that they're watching, that the babysitters are watching, uh, that movie. Movie. Oh my is God. the thing from another world. Oh, my God, you're Doctor right. <laughs> Ends up that was coming it. attractions for a carpenter. Yes. Oh, Here's man. a piece of trivia that Steve and I learned at UCF Film School. You know who played the monster, the thing in the first movie? Oh, my gosh. James Arness. Correct. I remember hearing that somewhere along the way. And so he was Who like, was in Gunsmoke, for those who don't correct. recognize the name. And so he, he was like, man, I worked my butt off. And this is it. And then someone said... In movies, they said, why don't you try television? Oh, okay, I'll give it a shot. And then he went over and became like the one of the most recognizable TV actors of all time. Wow. How about because that? That was his big role was this monster. You don't even see his face in the thing. 
And exactly. Exactly. Hey, guys, we just, just say- got, we just got our warning. So no rush. We got 10 minutes, but we'll want to start wrapping it up here okay. pretty soon. So go ahead, Steve. I, I just want to say one thing for the timeliness of this episode that Paul and I actually met him, Rico Browning. He yep. played the creature from the Black Lagoon in the original creature movie. There was okay. uh, three total uh, that Universal released. Okay, so was, he, was actually, he? Okay, was he in anything else? Because I don't recognize his name. No, he's well, a, he, he was, was an Olympic actually, diver. Yes. So oh, he did all okay. the underwater se- scenes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he was able to hold his breath for like you know a couple minutes at a time, wow. and they they shot a lot of that you know in, in the the Keys and Wakiva Springs, I believe. Uh, in in Central Florida, but Paul and I met him at hmm. down in West Palm Beach at a at a convention. Of, oh, it was probably about twenty years ago or so. Very oh. nice guy, but I awesome. just wanted to say, you know, uh, you know, uh, my my thoughts are with his family, and thank you for all the great memories. Uh, as that's one of my favorite movies as well of all time. Right. And Universal for years have been trying; they've been trying to re- remake that movie, yeah. and I just feel like they're going to totally screw it up. Oh, they will. Because yeah. They've, yeah. they've screwed up the Mummy remake which with Tom Cruise. They're trying to launch this dark universe. And they've failed. They failed with Dracula Untold, which was okay. I, I saw it once in the theaters. Um, yeah. The Tom Cruise Mummy franchise. And I know that they're, they're trying to make a modern version of the creature from the Black Lagoon. And I don't think it works. I, I, I don't see how they could get it to work. I think if they need to remake, if they're going to remake that movie, I have offered my services for free to direct that movie. What a guy. <laughs> so um, you can, they can check out my other work if they, if they would like to, but <laughs> uh, I, I, I recommend you, uh, you know, remakes most of the time don't work well. There are notable exceptions, but they usually don't work well. And if you spend money going to the movie, you walk, you usually walk out angry saying what the hell was i thinking yeah yeah except the, the i would say the greatest remake of all time and paul is going to hate me for this but Uh-oh. here it comes the dawn of the dead remake by Zack snyder i could kill you now i would <laughs> no no he's on my side i'm on your that side. movie was I, i've taken bumps in the toilet that are better in that movie that's you, yeah uh, yeah and i've seen those dumps and you're right they're better <laughs> Um, they are uh, scary. That was they're scary. (laughs) That was one of the first movies, perhaps the first, where I saw not only the original in a movie theater, then I saw the remake Mm. in a movie theater. So, uh, but the original, I loved it and saw it at midnight. By the way, at the Village Green, Paul, remember that Village Green? Of course, I yeah, yeah, Uh, saw it there at midnight, and uh, yeah, the remake, I just didn't like it. When we saw it. It was at the Palm Beach Mall, and back then it had it. It was like an X. It was like a porno movie. You had to be eighteen to go. Oh, it right. Be 17. It's so, yeah, scary. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. And it was NC my seventeen friends, when it came out on video. Yeah. Yeah. So my friend's girlfriend was an usher at the Palm Beach Mall theater, and we neither one of us were eighteen, and so we we're in line. She goes, "Okay, just sit here and shut up. You'll get in." And as we did, people were running out of the theater screaming, literally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my God! Oh my God! Just racing away. The other guys yeah. yelling, and and we're like, "I'm like, what the hell?" You know. Yeah. And then we go in there, and those it's a normal movie until there's this until black it's not. guy, black guy zombie, and a white a black girl. His, and he his rips wife. Her trapeze, uh, he rips her trapezius right. out. And I'm like, she thinks her husband's alive, and I'm she like, goes to hug him, and he just takes this gigantic bite right out of her traps yeah <laughs> you're like oh, oh no i see where this the is place going. exploded yeah yeah some first gag I, in that movie oh you're like oh lord yeah i just want to know movie. how many of us how many of us have malls that it still exist that look like the mall from dawn of the dead none <laughs> none yeah that's over that's history hey guys listen we said that we're going to try to wrap up each episode with like an honorary oscar and when we choose these honorary Oscars, it's going to be sort of like a spoof. It's not intended to be a real Oscar. It's like yes, a it guy. Is. It's like a guy who gave an over-the-top type of performance, or it's memorable for one reason or another, but not necessarily because it was really Oscar-worthy. But it's open to interpretation. So, does anybody have any of their honorary Oscar nominations? I'm going to go first. Um, go Dawn of the Dead, the original, the good one. Uh, the black guy. I think his name is Ken M.G. or something like that, maybe. And he's from Barbados, and right, he was in the remake. 
He was he was a reporter or something in the remake. But um, he I, I I cannot understand why him and the white cop those two cops they get more jobs. They were both fantastic in that movie. I thought he was. I, I actually believed you know because uh, think about it, this was one of the first movies where this black guy is a you know an honorable man and a hero is someone you want to look up to. It was it right. was brilliant. And right. he caught shit for that, caught stuff for that, casting a black guy. Like that. And he, he would, just like in the first movie, Not a Living Dead, the hero was a black guy too. Right, 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 right. So, all right, that's my, that's my. Okay, point. Steve, go ahead. So I'm going to go some, go along something similar here. Right. I think it was Tom Savini in, in Dawn of the Dead. So when they're, <laughs> the motorcycle gang is all getting attacked, I think it was Tom Savini, he was getting his blood pressure checked. And he's like, th- his friends are trying to get him no, it's not. He's not getting his blood pressure. <laughs> and he's like, "Well, I gotta get this my blood pressure," and they just rip him to pieces. <laughs> it is so funny. He's like, "I'm almost done." <laughs> okay, so since you guys are doing Dawn of the Dead, I don't know this actor's name, but in the remake, there's a guy who plays the dead Jay Leno who's walking around <laughs> in the parking lot. And they go, look, it's Jay Leno, and they shot him. So, so that guy gets the honorary Oscar. Sticking within Dawn of the Dead, that guy gets my honorary Oscar for this week. Whoever his name was, it wasn't really Jay Leno. And that's it why it wasn't Jay Leno. Was brilliant. Exactly. Oh. Okay, so you know what, Steve? Fair enough. It has moments. It has its moments. Okay, <laughs> I hated it, but it has moments. All right. Uh, okay, guys. Any final thoughts? No, I think we need to talk another episode or two on horror. And okay. stay with Carpenter, maybe the next episode. That way, Steve and I are super far, and you will be too. And uh, I just have one honorable mention for our listeners. If they haven't seen this movie, it's from 2007. It's a great horror monster movie, uh, 30 Days of Night. It combines oh, good. vampires in Alaska. Uh, it, and I think it takes place in Barrow, Alaska, the, the northernmost town. And it, it is it's violent as hell. And it's just got some great gore. Not really scary, but it's got some really tremendous gory decapitation. Wasn't it scenes. like Josh so Hartnett check it out. or somebody like yeah. that? Yeah, Josh Hartnett. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, that was. I, I enjoyed that. That was a good movie. Uh, okay. How much time so, do we uh, have? Uh, if you got a final thought, give it quick. Oh, no, my final thought is I love that movie so much. I was in UCLA film school, and everybody couldn't shut up about No Country for Old Men. And I purposely started an argument where I, I wanted that to be best picture over No Country for Old Men, which I really didn't like that movie that much. I was like, that's awful. I'd rather see 30 Days a Night. And people were looking at me. I, I said, I'm much more entertained with that movie than No Country for Old Men. People were yelling at me at this at this meeting. It was great. I did yeah, it, you know. 30 Days a Night has one of those where they hacked that guy's head off. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they just showed that. And right. then they up it at the end where the guy gets his arm caught in that machine that right. was like a right. metal uh machine that tears metal up and uh ripped right. his arm off i was like wow. i gotta go watch that tomorrow <laughs> damn it okay i'm just gonna add for me uh no country for all men it grew over time because i didn't like it originally i grew to, i grew to like it but we'll get into that another day i like the root canal it grows over time i'm oh, sorry <laughs> okay so for now that's it um if you're watching please like comment and subscribe don't forget this is the great classic movie debate we are the sister twisted sister channel of the great classic rock debate until we meet again i am kenny paul i'm steve all right and we'll see you next time bye Bye.